Former President Jimmy Carter is most known today for his energy and his dedication to nonprofit agencies and his work on behalf of a cause. Many are familiar with what he has done here in the 21st century, but some of his directives when he was president may need to be revisited. One in particular may have been forgotten. In February of 1980, President Carter designated the week of March the 8th as National Women's History Week. In a statement then, he wrote in part that too often women were unsung and sometimes their contributions went unnoticed. Now, seven years later in 1987, Congress decided to ramp up Carter's designation and proclaimed the entire month of March to remember, to pay tribute, and to recognize women and their impact on the entire world. The Durham Sports Commission is an important part of not only the growth of the city, but also the growth of our national community. And founded in 2016, the DSC recognizes the opportunities that exist given all of the assets that are at hand. One such opportunity is the ability to bring together thought leaders for an engaging conversation here during National Women's History Month. Sports in the Bull City is important, and we're thrilled to bring you another installment of the Commission's Bull Sessions, this time to explore several aspects of women in sports. So with that, let me introduce to you our guest today. Today we have Ashley Bratcher with us. Ashley is the Senior Director of Operations for USA Baseball. Located in Cary, North Carolina, Ashley holds an amazing responsibility in what has historically been an industry full of men. She was named to the post in 2015, and she oversees the general management of the USA Baseball 12 and under, 15 and under, and the women's national teams. In addition to running three national programs, she also see, oversees the national team identification series, the national team championships, and the 13U-14U Athlete Development Program. She graduated from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill in May of 2009. And if you want to learn just a little bit more about Ashley's background, I invite you to visit usabaseball.com forward slash about forward slash staff. So with that, Ashley, welcome to the program. Trip, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you are very welcome, and my name is Trip Durham, and I am thrilled to be leading this bull session today. Ashley, your bio tells us a little bit about you, but to better acclimate our audience with you and that background, can you give us a couple of the building blocks as to what has led to this sports life for you? Yeah, I think you'll hear a lot of people in sports, male or female, say that you know they were exposed to sports from an early age. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, inherent values in sports that draw people into sport, um, whether they're playing or working in sports. So for me, I was raised in a big, a big family, a decent sized family. I have a couple of sisters and a brother. Um, so I think early on, I was kind of exposed to a, a team type environment, if you will. Um, you know, we were raised sort of all hands on deck mentality. So, you know, to our dismay, we all had our fair share of chores. Um, you know, when you were able to drive, you, you had to take a younger sibling to school. Uh, we went to all of each other's games, sporting events, um, piano recitals, thanks to my youngest sister. So I just, you know, we grew up in a, an everyone chips in type environment, so to speak. And, and that was necessary for us to all accomplish what it was we wanted to accomplish. And I think that's really speaks to, you know, the core values of sport and, and being a part of a team. Um, you know, we were, you know, we, we were told to go outside a lot, I think, because there were a handful of us. Um, so getting creative, um, getting competitive with everything we did, I think we made, you know, every little tiny thing into a competition, um, splitting up into teams all the time. Um, you know, we all played sports. My, my brother played in college uh, baseball. My sister played basketball overseas. Um, so I just, you know, I think being indoctrinated in it from an early age, um, having a, an appreciation for teamwork and competition, hard work. Um, and then I just think the selflessness aspect of it and really being able to celebrate others' accomplishments and 
sometimes sacrificing your own wants and needs to make sure somebody else can um, accomplish what they're looking to do. So I, I think those are the things that help me gravitate towards sport um, and, and just really have a love for it f from the beginning, really. Yeah, we all grew up in that environment, or at least a lot of us did. Don't come <laughs> home until the street lights come on. And so right. um, with that, was there ever an aha moment for you in sport? You talk about being competitive for an early age, but was there that moment for a career in which you went, you know, I, I think I could do this for a living? Yeah, I think when I realized I wasn't going to get a college scholarship, um, I was my hand was forced a little bit. Maybe um, I had some opportunities to play some collegiate softball. Um, I, I grew up a big fan of the Tar Heels. I know we're on a Durham Durham podcast here, um, but grew up a big fan of the Tar Heels. Really wanted to go to Carolina. So I think, you know, when when opportunities to play at the varsity level at Carolina didn't present themselves, you know, I was my hand was sort of forced to pursue um, how did I want to stay in sport? Because I knew that that I did want to stay in sport. I, uh, one thing I will say is I think probably less commonplace, but at the time I was entering in college, I didn't know what that meant. Um, you know, I thought basically that meant you were an athletic trainer or a coach. <laughs> Um, and I didn't know how else to work in sports. So I actually started with the athletic training program um, at North Carolina, um, did a couple of semesters in that program, worked with the gymnastics team, and they had us do some stuff at local high schools um, and really thought that that was going to be my avenue to work in sport. Um, and then I think it was the third or fourth semester, they require you to take a cadaver lab, which I learned uh, means you start the beginning of the semester with a cadaver face down and you spend the first part of the semester dissecting the, you know, all of the back of the cadaver. <laughs> and then some point in the semester, you turn the cadaver over and you dissect the whole front. And I, if, if you want an aha moment, I knew, <laughs> I knew right in that moment, I did not want to be an athletic trainer. Um, so I, I, you know, I reevaluated what other opportunities there were. UNC did have a sport administration program at the time. Some of the sort of baseline exercise and sports science courses I had taken um, kind of put me on a natural path for the sport admin program. So I pretty immediately changed my major. Uh, began working with the women's soccer program, which is you know legendary in its own right over there. Um, and I think that was real, where I really got exposed to the behind the scenes of, you know, pre-game, post-game, travel, in-game video, you know, equipment, all of the stuff that goes into, um, you know, a successful sporting event taking place. Um, and it showed me that there was a way to be involved in the big picture capacity. Um, and I really wanted to help and make, make those events happen for the athletes and coaches and in the way that I was able to contribute, um, given that I knew I wasn't going to be an athletic trainer at that point. So I'm going to ask the next question, knowing that there's a baseline, our society throughout the decades, uh, sport has been dominated by the presence of men. What is it like being a female in traditionally a man's world? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, probably go a couple different ways here. I'll start by saying, you know, I think that only has as much weight as you put into it. Um, and it, playing sports, I've been around male teammates and male coaches and I have brother and, you know, so I think, uh, you know, it kind of starts with us as, as women. Um, I think at the end of the day, male or female people want to win they want to be successful in whatever way they define success and that's that's not just in sports maybe that's losing the weight i set out to lose or being better about saving money and and uh, you know accomplishing small personal goals like that but people people want to find success and in that sort of journey to do so they want to be around others who raise them up and show that they want them to be successful as well so with that in mind, I think is, you know, in this scenario as as women in a man's world, but, you know, we could be talking about young or old, or we could be talking about race. Um, I think it's a, 
it's an effort to demonstrate to your peers that you also want to win, you also want to succeed, you want to help them achieve whatever larger larger mission or goal they have. Um, and so showing that you care and want to be part of the solution um, is really important. So, so to circle back on that, how do we do that? I think, you know, the number one way we can do that is by working hard. Um, I think hard work is genderless, ageless, raceless. You know, I think anybody who can works, who works hard um, is putting a direct reflection on how much they care. Um, you know, sometimes we say, you know, a direct reflection of your give a damn. So people want to work with other people that care and who want to accomplish the larger goals. And I think all of that transcends gender. Um, so I think when you approach things in this manner, you show you're willing to put in the work, pull your own weight. Um, I think that just creates for a much more comfortable, comfortable environment for everyone, sort of regardless of, of gender or age or any of that. The other thing I think that does is when you know you're putting in the hard work um, and you're prepared, it helps eliminate self-doubt. Um, and I think if we're feeling as though we don't belong as women, um, then, then it's really hard for others to accept us and, and we really can't ask that of them if, if we haven't done so ourselves. Um, so at the end of the day, I think it's about not giving others permission to make us feel as though we don't belong. Um, I think the last piece to that would probably be um, making sure in this pursuit that we are ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, no female is, is the same. Um, you'll hear the word authentic a lot, but what we can bring to the table, just like what men can bring to the table, are, are diverse skill sets and the larger group um, really benefits when we all bring our, ourselves to the table and what we have to offer. So if we're, if we're finding ourselves in a place where we're changing who we are to fit into this quote unquote man's world, then it's, it's really not a good situation for anybody, um, the larger group included. So I just, I think that's one thing to keep in mind as, as we, you know, venture into, to different arenas where we maybe are supposed to feel unwelcomed. It's a devil's advocate question, and I want the audience to realize that I'm doing this just to stir the pot to see if we <laughs> might be able to get some engaging conversation. Is it a juxtaposition that a female is in a man's industry? From my seat, yes. Um, I, I can't, I can't, um, sometimes I have trouble wondering why that's the case. Um, and if we're not making it more of a thing than it really needs to be. I mean, women play sports all the time. There's, you know, you look at a collegiate campus, there's the whole department's worth of, of female athletics. Um, so why is it weird that women work in sports? And, and why, you know, so sometimes I, I can't help but think that maybe we're making it a bit more of a thing than it really even should be. March is set aside, we've established this, March is set aside as being a time to reflect on the contributions for women. And I wonder in your career, have there been barriers ahead of you inside this sports life? And are those barriers predicated upon discrimination? And I'll only ask the question, Ashley, because sometimes to move forward, you have to break down barriers. And again, sometimes barriers may be caused by discriminations, your thoughts about the microcosm of your career and how it may provide insights to the industry at large? Yeah, I'll, I have to admit, I mean, I've been extremely lucky. Um, I, I can't say that I've been overtly discriminated against, um, but, but that's my story. And I know that my story is not everyone's story. And I'm acutely aware of other situations that, you know, aren't as friendly of a trail as I've been fortunate to have. Um, and again, that's not to say that, you know, things aren't said behind your back. <laughs> um, but, but as far as I know, I haven't faced overt discrimination. You know, there are subtle things, uh, I think, that happen to all of us. Um, you know, you walk into a room with two male counterparts, you know, to meet, you know, new clients or whatever that might be, and the assumption is, that one of the two men is is the boss, which which may not be the case. Um, you know, again, nobody in the room is is meaning to discriminate against you in that instance, but there are assumptions made. 
the other thing I'll say is baseball's funny. I think the folks in football will probably echo this um, in that a number of us, while there are women that have played baseball and football, it's a little bit more non-traditional to have grown up playing those sports. Um, you know, soccer, basketball, hockey, there's, you know, endless women that grew up playing those sports. So, you know, baseball specifically, there's a little bit of an underlying stigma or suggestion that because you didn't grow up playing the sport or play it at a collegiate level or, um, you know, in the lower minor leagues or whatever, that you, how could you possibly know? Um, so that's that's been a little bit of something different to sort of navigate over the years. There is a um, a term that comes to mind, and it's the word fair, F A I R. And we talk about being kids, right, and playing until the streetlights come on. And I can remember being six years old, as you probably do too. You know, something happened, and that's just not fair. <laughs> and at a young age, we're really aware of the word fair. As you've gotten older and as you've led this sports life and you're in a career that is baseball oriented, how do you view the word fair now as a working professional? Yeah, totally. I think my parents' favorite saying, or, or probably not favorite, but most repeated was, well, life's not fair. Um, and I, I think we've all as we get older can appreciate that um, a, a little bit more. Um, I, I, for me, this a situation that's truly unfair just raises the stakes um, and further sort of lights the fire to accomplish, if you will. Um, you know, if something is truly unfair, it's indicative of, you know, someone's sort of starting on uneven footing or, you know, a, a disadvantage. Um, and I think when when an unfair dynamic is created, it's just raised the stakes for you and it makes accomplishing or defeating or whatever the end game is that much sweeter. So is unfair a thing? It can be. Um, but I think, you know, focusing on whether or not something's fair is a distraction from, you know, the actual end game. In your time at USA Baseball, and we established you've been there since 2015, you're obviously in a chair in which you're able to watch the world and the industry move. Have you seen a shift in women in sports in the time that you've been in carry and watching things? Yeah, I have. So I, I actually started there in 2009, and 2015 was my most recent sort of responsibility change. So I, I referenced that because when I was hired full time in the fall of 2009, I was the only full time female on staff. Um, and so I think there were maybe like eight or nine total staff members and I was the only female. Um, I was 23. Uh, I think the next closest guy in age was maybe closer to late 20s, 30. Um, most of them were married. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it was it was different for me. Um, and now we have 13 full-time females on staff and, you know, not just on staff, but, you know, leading departments, you know, we have uh, a senior director of safe athlete safety and education. We have a senior director of retail. We have women in leadership positions um, at USA Baseball and spanning all of the different departments. You know, we have accounting and retail and media and, um, there's three women just in the operations department alone, which has, is kind of where more the anomaly comes in for um, women in sports. We've had female coaches working male events. Um, Veronica Alvarez, who's a female alum of ours, um, who's been doing spring training with the Oakland A's the past few years. Um, you know, she's been coaching, helping coach some of our men's teams, which was not a thing when I started there. Um, and the, the, probably the most encouraging thing is the female intern applications we're seeing. We're seeing more and more females applying for internships across all of our different departments, which just leads me to believe that, um, you know, they're entering their college careers knowing that working in sports is an option for them. I think this next question could be categorized sort of as a best practice. We talked about juxtaposition and how we define that and the word fair. When you think about visibility, what's the right way for women who want to be inside the industry of sport to increase their visibility, to become noticed? Again, a best practice. What do you offer there? Yeah, so 
I mean, I, there's a couple of things. First, I'll say it's it's a slippery slope a little bit because those that go into sport administration and baseball operations are sort of signing up for behind the scenes um, because that is that is sort of the name of the game in this job is that um, you, all of your work is done before and after and behind the scenes and hopefully nobody knows who you are because the job was done well enough that you weren't needed, um, you know, somewhere seriously along the way. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, you have to say social media, you can't ignore um, the machine that social media is. Um, I think we have to do a better job of raising our hands and, and applying for jobs that we, we think we want and are deserving of. Um, I think in doing that, um, we're creating our own element of visibility, whether or not we get the job, we're knocking on the door and reminding um, you know, men in the industry that there are capable, desiring women out there who, who would like to be considered. Um, we have to ask for it. I, I don't subscribe to the, you know, women aren't being given opportunities when women aren't asking for them um, mindset. I think the other thing is we have to get creative in what it means to work in sports. Um, you know, I was very narrow minded that that was ATC or coach, you know, I've sort of broadened my horizons over the years. Um, you know, like one example is analytics and baseball is huge. It's becoming bigger and bigger. There are programs out there. Um, there's a wonderful nonprofit called girls who code that's providing opportunities to teach girls how to learn coding. And that opens, I don't know if these girls know it at the time, but that opens doors for them to work in sports that. I'm sure they're not going to a computer science class considering what they could do for a major league team down the road, um, but just getting creative and where these avenues might exist for, for women to get more and more involved. Walk us down that path a little bit further about social media, if you will. Social media, whether you like it or not, is an extension of somebody's <laughs> brand. And social media can be loud. It can be loud to the positive. It can be loud to the negative. How does social media factor into that visibility? Sure, I'll, I'll start with the negative so we can end on a good note. Um, I think, you know, there's definitely negativity out there. Um, for every, you know, feel good story about a female that's being promoted on a social media platform, there's a man somewhere in the world that can't resist commenting get back in the kitchen it's just like you know it's i guess it has to happen um and it's hard not to feel bad for him thinking that he needs a woman to eat but no but seriously there's you know there's lots of negativity and naysayers but we we everyone male female has to be above that um they didn't put the work in you did to get there um they don't know the individual being highlighted so they they really don't deserve to have any say in their success as, as far as i'm concerned um you know, on the positive side, it brings awareness, of course. Um, seeing is believing, um, you know, it's just, you know, the aspirational component to it, I think, of, of being able to see someone that looks like you and sounds like you um, doing something that maybe you didn't consider being able to do. Um, I think it expands our horizons as uh, going back to what possibilities do exist, you know, um, uh, Rachel Luba, who's a, a baseball agent who, who just signed Trevor Bauer to the most lucrative deal, she's super loud on, on social media. And, and I'm, I'm not disparaging her for that, but she's showing lots of young women out there that being an agent is, is a possibility. Um, you can be a scout, you can be an official or an umpire. Um, so again, just broadening our horizons um, by seeing what's on social media. But I, I all of that to be said, I think the, the best piece of, of social media is the relatability that it brings to us of not just that I can see that Rachel Luba is an agent, but I can hear what she has to say. I can see the behind the scenes. I can see what she likes and engages with. And, you know, at the end of some amount of time, she's just another person like us. Um, she's a normal person. And it, it, I think it helps the goals not feel so far fetched. Last question really along these lines. You mentioned that you've been at USA Baseball since 2009. Was it ever hard for you to belong in baseball? Um, I, I can't say that it has been for me. I've been extremely, extremely fortunate. Um, again, I know not everyone has had <clears throat> the same experience as I have, but 
I think it's really a tribute to the folks I've been lucky enough to work with, um, male and female. Um, but the male coworkers, coaches, scouts, they've just always been so supportive. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's because they have, you know, strong female presence in their life or um, they're just supportive of what women can bring to the game. But I, and, and I do think they should be applauded for that um, because they've created an environment where where I'm able to sit here and tell you that, you know, I haven't had those issues and I am comfortable working in the sport. Applauding, I think, is a great segue to what happened in 2020. A comment or two that I'd like from you. We have a general manager who's female that is hired with the Miami Marlins. We have a soccer player turned place kicker for Vanderbilt football. 2020 was a, a great milestone, crossroads. It was, it was a, a year to celebrate. Absolutely, it was. Um... Yeah, wow is all I can say on the Kimming the Kimming hire. Um, you know, she she just that's that's talking about someone who's dedicated her career, um, a lifetime to accomplish that feat, um, and she couldn't be more deserving. Um, you know, I know I can't speak for Kim, um, but I I know for Kim that this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I I don't think. In trivia questions, she wants to be remembered as as being the first female GM. Um, I don't think getting the job is the end game for her. Um, I'm sure she wants to win a World Series and accomplish all of these other wonderful things in that position. So I'm really excited to see her um, finally, or, you know, get the opportunity that she's deserved and and get to show us why she's deserving of it. You know, for Sarah, um, that that was kind of a cool thing. Um, I don't I don't know the full backstory. My understanding is she's a soccer player, um, but the football team had a need. And um, kudos to the football team for getting creative and and even considering the you know the soccer player on the female team a, as a an option to you know fill their need. And then kudos to Sarah for you know I'm sure you know those are uncharted waters and you know. The media and the naysayers and all the stuff that came with it, I'm sure at times was overwhelming. Um, but I think it's just a, an example of, you know, women's um, desire to rise to the occasion. Um, and so awesome things that happened this year, and, and I look forward to seeing many more of them. Just as a quick side note for those who are watching and listening, Sarah Fetters, who used to be in the communications office at Duke, Sarah is now at Vanderbilt, and she's the one that was alongside of Sarah Fuller in her awesome. journey. And there's a lot of great content that you can find on both Sarah Fetter's website or on her social channels, as well as that with Vandy. It's just some really neat backstory stuff. So uh, as we wrap up our time, Ashley, I know that in your office, in the bottom right-hand drawer, you have a crystal ball. Uh, after we get off of this chat and you rub that crystal ball and look towards, say, 2030, what do you think the environment will be like for women in sports, and how do you think we will have gotten there over the last nine years? Oh, that's a that's a loaded question. Good thing I have a crystal ball here. Um, <laughs> I, I guess the first thing I see in my crystal ball is Kim Ng's got that World Series ring on. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, no, but you know what I see um, is that we're, we've gotten to a place where the headline is is no longer first female. Um, it's no longer an anomaly, uh, and not just in sport and, and science, whatever the arena might be. Um, and and I think we've got you know we'll get to the place where we're past the first. Um, and, and thanks to all of the trailblazers, um, you know, that's part of the process in, in anything. Um, but I, I want to see it become commonplace. And I know commonplace sounds boring um, and, and isn't exciting. And the, the journalist will have to find something new to highlight. Um, but I think, you know, if we've gotten to a place where first female blank or, you know, female is is no longer sort of preceding the accomplishment then then we've really um we'd be in a really good place come 2030 
Yeah, that's an awesome way to end it, and a nice little bow that you put on it as well. Ashley, we appreciate you being with us. If folks do want to reach out to you in one medium or another, what's the best way that they can do that? Um, probably the best way would be Twitter. Um, it's just my last name, A, so Bratcher A. Um, and then my, my email is on the USA Baseball website. Um, if it's preferred to reach out over email, you can find it there, and I'm happy to engage with folks. Outstanding. Well, thank you for all that you do for a sport that we all love and an industry <laughs> which means a whole lot to a lot of folks. And folks, you have been watching and listening as a reminder to the Bull Sessions that is provided to you by the Durham Sports Commission, and you can find them online at durhamncsports.com. My name is Trip Durham. That is Ashley Bratcher. We appreciate you being with us today. Thanks, Trip.